Good afternoon, wherever you may be joining us from today. My name is Peter Martinez, and I'm the Executive Director of Secure World Foundation. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual event today to mark the public launch of our briefing book on space policy and space sustainability for the incoming Biden administration. For those of you who may not be familiar with the concept of space sustainability and the work of Secure World Foundation, allow me to give a brief background about the issues we work on. Our world is increasingly reliant on space systems in many ways that touch the lives of billions of people on a daily basis. Space systems support human and environmental security, national security, commerce, and economic development in many ways. Indeed, such are the benefits of space activities that we're witnessing an exciting and accelerating rate of growth in the number and diversity of space actors and the emergence of new kinds of space activities. These developments will bring the benefits of space activities to even more people on the ground while laying the foundations for the future growth of a vibrant space economy. Yet these space systems operate in an environment that is becoming increasingly congested and hazardous. There are currently around 3,000 operational satellites circling the Earth, and a much larger and growing number of non-functional satellites and other debris in space that pose collision hazards for these space systems upon which we rely so much. Current trends indicate that we will see at least a tenfold increase in the number of satellites over the coming decade, raising concerns about space flight safety. In addition to the challenges posed by space debris and the growing congestion of the Earth's orbital environment, we are witnessing a worrying proliferation of counter space capabilities around the world. The testing of anti-satellite weapons in orbit can produce long-lived debris that poses a risk to other space users. These multiple challenges, if not addressed, will seriously compromise our ability to continue to enjoy the benefits of space activities that we have come to take for granted. Space sustainability is therefore about taking the necessary actions to ensure that all humanity can continue to use space for peaceful purposes and economic benefit, now and in the long term. This brings us to Secure World Foundation and the topic of today's briefing. We are a private operating foundation that strives to ensure the secure, sustainable and peaceful uses of outer space contributing to global stability and benefits on Earth. We work with governments, industry, international organizations and civil society organizations around the world to develop and promote ideas and actions towards this goal. This chart provides a snapshot of our activities during 2019. Last year, we carried out 102 projects and activities in collaboration with partners in North America, Central America, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, the Asia Pacific region, and Oceania. Our projects cover different aspects of space sustainability, space security, space policy, and space law. There are several ways in which we carry out our mission. Firstly, SWF is a trusted provider of credible, balanced, and objective information on the issues pertaining to our mission. We believe that informed, inclusive dialogue needs to be supported with accurate and reliable information. This slide shows some examples of the resources that we produce. This includes our booklet on space sustainability, our handbook for new actors in space, which has been translated into Spanish and is soon to be available in French and Chinese as well, and also our open source assessment of global counter space capabilities. These resources are all freely available on our website, www.swfound.org. Another important role we play is to facilitate dialogues that might otherwise not occur. These include unofficial dialogues among experts and officials from different countries to help build common understandings on certain topics that help to lay the foundation for subsequent, more formal dialogues. This slide shows the Global Space Security Conference, which we co-organize with the United Nations Institute of Disarmament Research in Geneva each year. We also stimulate multi-stakeholder discussions 
on all the different facets of space sustainability. This is an image of a panel discussion in our 2019 Summit on Space Sustainability, which brought together leading international experts from government, industry, and civil society to discuss potential solutions to space sustainability challenges. Another role that we play is to promote awareness of space sustainability issues and cooperative governance solutions. Secure World Foundation has permanent observer status in the United Nations, which allows us to contribute to the discussion in UN bodies related to space, such as the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, shown in this slide. We also support the United Nations in their efforts to build capacity in space law in countries with emerging space programs. Turning now to the topic of today's briefing, America's recent space successes and continuing benefits of space activities are the result of prescient space policy decisions across multiple administrations. From the decision by the Clinton administration to provide full accuracy for civil GPS signals, to the Reagan administration's decision to open up space for commercial participation, to the Obama administration's decision to go ahead with NASA's commercial crew program, space policy decisions can affect the daily lives of everyone and be visible like few other government policy decisions can. The Trump administration sought to bring renewed focus and public visibility to space policy. While some of the Trump administration's decisions and in initiatives in the realm of space activities have occasioned criticism, that is more due to the political rhetoric accompanying them rather than the substance. Many of the Trump administration's space policy decisions continue long-standing principles and goals that have persisted across multiple administrations, both Republican and Democrat, because they reflect core American values and national interests. First and foremost among those interests is sustained U.S. international leadership in ensuring the long-term sustainability, safety, and security of the space domain and space activities. As the incoming Biden administration begins setting its policy agenda for the next four years, Secure World Foundation has developed an issue brief to provide background and recommendations on key issues to help the U.S. meet current and emerging challenges in outer space. This brief contains recommendations on issues ranging from fostering a vibrant commercial space sector to dealing with threats from counter space activities. The briefing document addresses a range of topics. This slide shows an overview of all the topics covered in the issue brief, which is publicly available on the Secure World Foundation website. A selection of these topics will be addressed today by three of the authors of this document. We have decided to structure the briefing in an interview format in which we, and which we hope will make it more interesting for you. We are delighted to welcome onto our virtual stage, Jacqueline Felcher, who will moderate today's discussion. Ms. Felcher is an award-winning journalist based in Washington, DC, covers national security and space for Politico. And we're looking forward to the questions that she will pose to our team. Before starting our discussion, let me give you some information to enhance your participation in today's event. It will be possible for you, the audience, to ask questions. If you wish to ask questions, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Before asking your question, please check the list of questions already asked by other participants and upvote the ones that you would like to see answered. If your question does not appear on the list, please type it in the space provided, but please try to keep it short and simple so that we can get as many questions as possible. If you would like to see closed captions of the discussion, click on the closed captions button at the bottom of the Zoom window and then click on show subtitle. With that, I now turn over to Jacqueline, the floor over to Jacqueline Felcher. She will introduce our panelists and get the conversation going. Thank you, and please enjoy the event. Great, thank you so much, Peter. I am so excited to be here today for this incredibly timely and interesting conversation. I'm joined by three analysts from the Secure World Foundation who work on the paper, 
um, Brian Whedon, the Director of Program Planning, Victoria Sampson, the Washington Office Director, and Ian Christensen, the Director of Private Sector Programs. Um, so without further ado, Peter gave us such a great introduction. Uh, I want to jump right in and start off with the Space Force. So the new service was established about a year ago in part to speed up the military's acquisition for space platforms. One of the recommendations in the report is to do more on that front, to be able to, to restructure the acquisition programs even further. Um, Victoria, I'd like to start with you. Have you seen any improvement on this front in the service's first year and what more needs to be done? Well, thank you, Jacqueline. It has been a long road in coming and this has been a conversation that's been had by military officials and national security specialists for decades now about how really to improve military space acquisition. So with the establishment of the Space Force hitting its one year um, birthday just recently, um, I think the fact that it's still gearing itself together. Part of the problem though, is that there's still a lack of clarity as to what it's supposed to be, what it's supposed to be solving, what's the problem it's supposed to be solving. Is it solving military acquisition? Is it meant to do provide space deterrence? Is it meant to be a show of force? Is it meant to be the future of national security space? Um, there's been a lot of mixed messaging on that, particularly from the previous administration, the Trump administration, that used it as a sense to promote a more, I think, aggressive approach to space than perhaps the documents and the um, doctrine actually warranted. So we're still in the early stages of figuring out where it's gonna go. Um, my colleague, Brian, can agree with me or not. I, I really think the Biden administration, it would be helpful to maintain it and then figure out, okay, how do we best focus the discussion so they can really improve military space acquisition so it's responsive and you provide um, continued um, military use of our national security space assets. Sorry, I'm muted. Brian, would you like to add anything there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you're absolutely correct. Uh, reforming and improving the way we do national security space acquisitions was absolutely one of the big drivers of the creation of the Space Force. At this point, it is way too early to tell whether there's actually been any real changes there. We have seen some changes with the creation of the, of the, the, the Space Development Agency, the SDA, but that happened separate from the Space Force. And at this point, SDA is outside of the Space Force. Uh, there was supposed to be uh, earlier this year, a, a, a document put out from the Space Force on how they're gonna do acquisition reform. That has been delayed. It was you know, kind of published and then pulled back, I think because of the sort of bureaucratic debates and challenges and some political challenges from Congress. But this remains one of the areas where we really haven't seen a whole lot yet is how to improve this uh, and how to, you know, how to handle the acquisitions um, uh, coordination, not only within the Space Force and SDA and S SMC that are existing entities, but also across the services with rolling out sort of the, the end user devices that match up with the satellites. And then we have how to coordinate with the National Reconnaissance Office, which is still going to continue to do intelligence space outside of uh, what the Space Force is doing. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we point out in our report, fixing, which is a whole debate of what that means, space acquisitions is one of the key areas that Space Force needs to focus on and, and sort of starting this process of, you know, addressing these challenges is something that needs to happen as soon as possible. So Victoria, I, I do want to follow up on something you said about sort of clarifying future missions for the Space Force, which has faced a lot of misconceptions that are not helped by the Netflix show. So what can the incoming Biden administration do to sort of, you know, revamp the PR campaign for the Space Force, so to speak? How do you present this mission in a way that, that is serious and to, to kind of inform the American public what this branch is supposed to be doing? I mean, that's an excellent question. Um, we can't blame Steve Carell for everything. Um, I think they're really tapping into a, a way of thinking that has, I think, been often misused deliberately by the Trump administration um, because it fits into a structure about how they want to promote um, national security space. I mean, I, the question really is, you know, how do you really demonstrate to the public that the Space Force is needed, but also you're not gonna be putting boots on the moon? Um, part of that can be done by um, being careful what sort of commercials are run, which sounds silly, 
but you know, if you talk, you see a, an ad for the Space Force and it talks about you two someday you can go into space. I mean, really the Space Force folks are gonna be on the ground controlling satellites. Not going anywhere, I'm sorry to say, you may go to a different space base on planet Earth, um, and, which isn't quite as exciting a narrative, um, but it, it's what it is and it, it's what's needed to be done. So I think stuff like that needs to be done as well. Um, I think that um, the Biden administration needs to be careful in how they refer to what the Space Force is going to be doing. Um, sometimes it gets interwoven with concerns about what's going to be happening with Moon, um, but that's not necessarily what's going to be happening. Um, and so I think it's just, I think a more careful phrasing and discussions about what the Space Force is intended to do and what is beyond its can yet. Um, you know, decades out, there may be a whole other conversation about the Space Force may or may not be doing, but when we're looking at the next five, 10 years, that's it now. And the other thing that we get asked a lot is, you know, well, can the Biden administration just undo the Space Force? No, it cannot. Um, Congress funded it, therefore Congress can undo it. But it really, the Space Force does fit a need, as Brian said, for military space acquisition, re revamping and figuring out, okay, how do we ensure resilient, um, mission resiliency for national security space capabilities. That need is there. Um, and um, so it's unlikely that Space Force will be going away. We just need to figure out how it can be harnessed to be more effective for US national security um, goals and, and guidelines. Brian, do you want to respond to that as well in terms of the, the PR campaign and even how the lawmakers have obviously approved it, but there are probably many lawmakers who aren't on the relevant committees on the Hill who even aren't aren't super sure about what this is doing. No, I, I think just to read a couple of things that, that Victoria said, you know, I think there are there there were underlying challenges need to be addressed. Space Force is not perhaps the, the best solution, but is the solution we have. So the, the issue is let's make sure that it is focused on addressing those challenges. Uh, to, to emphasize a couple of things Victoria talked about, we hear a lot of discussion about how we're doing war fighting in space now. That is true from a certain perspective, but what that means, I think, often gets misconstrued uh, in, in the public domain. To the military, having a, a warfighter mentality, a warfighter perspective, it, has, it means the way you look at problems and, and sort of how you approach when something goes wrong, when you have an anomaly, the process you go through to think about how to resolve those. Uh, that you're sort of building systems that where you expect there to be interference, you expect things to be other, an adversary to be, you know, dealing with it. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going out and killing people. And, and I think that is an often thing that gets misconstrued. So I think part of this is sort of either doing a better job of explaining what's going on, or, or in some cases even, you know, modifying some of some of the language. Um, the last piece I'll just say is, you know, also we think there needs to be a firm a clarification of the division of labor between NASA and the Space Force. NASA is going to be focused on science, it's gonna be focused on human space flight, on exploration, all good things. The Space Force is gonna be focused on military activities, uh, security activities, space domain awareness. And I think the Biden administration could do a lot to clarify that separation because we there's been some messaging that has signaled that maybe that those, those things are blurring together and, and we should try and do what we can to keep those separate. So the Space Force is obviously been a top priority for the president. I want to turn to another of the president's sign signature space missions, which is the Artemis mission to return humans to the moon. Um, Ian, I, I'd like to start with you on this one. What do you recommend President-elect Biden do to sort of keep the momentum going? The, the funding hasn't necessarily come through, which, which I want to ask about a little bit later, but this is definitely something that people are talking about to get to the moon in 2024. How do you sort of keep that momentum? Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, really appreciate the question. I think this has been a question or some variation on this question has been the most frequent thing that we um, have, have heard from our international network at Secure World is what is the future of the Artemis program? Will the U.S. continue with the Artemis program? And, and what does that what does that look like? Um, so in our brief, um, we, do, we do discuss uh, the Artemis program. Um, at this juncture, we see the Artemis program um, and space exploration in general actually uh, having considerable importance um, for both stability and governance of, of space, ex space exploration and space activities. Um, there's significant governmental, scientific, and commercial consensus that's focused on the return to the moon right now. Uh, and Artemis we see is both 
a reflection of that and a driver for that. So there's a feedback uh, feedback that loop there. Uh, we do urge the Biden administration to continue with a, a programmatic focus on lunar activities while being realistic about the timelines on which those activities um, can be expected to occur. Um, so we see a number of our international partners have made uh, financial and programmatic commitments to Artemis. We uh, would hope that uh, the Biden administration sees that as an opportunity to, to be a, a stable and valuable partner in the international community and continue to, to move forward with that program. Uh, we're also interested in further discussion around a, a different aspect of the Artemis program, and that is the Artemis Accords, which we see as a very practical step forward uh, towards the governance of space activities and addressing some real kind of near-term and medium-term questions we have around the use of lunar resources, safety zones, non-interference, um, those sorts of things. Um, so we hope that the Biden administration continues uh, discussions around those principles, including engaging with uh, nations that are not directly participating in the Artemis program. Um, so we really do look forward to a, to a continuing conversation around uh, how to execute uh, aspects of, of lunar return and, and on a practical time, timeline. In terms of what you've been hearing from international partners, has the Artemis program, it, has it happened for long enough and moved forward long enough that if it were to stop, international partners would sort of be left stranded if they, they've already made these investments. Yeah, so I think, um, I think a lot of international partners would be in a very difficult uh, policy position if, if the program were to, were to be reduced. Um, for instance, um, Japan has made a significant financial uh, commitment to the program and has also um, undergone a fairly significant revision to aspects of its basic space law to further enable um, space exploration. And so that sort of... Um, actions is clearly tied uh, to Artemis, and it would be difficult, um, I think, cause some difficult questions um, within the Japanese government to, uh, to reorient that should, should things change. I mean, I think similar, uh, similar conditions have been made um, in, in Canada, for instance, where significant commitment has been made to the Gateway program, um, and that is a, an element of Artemis, right, a, a complementary aspect, and so uh, the future of that program would, would, be a, would be a question within our our Canadian allies, and we've got just similar examples in, in places like Italy and Luxembourg as well. So um, I do think that there have been some fairly significant commitments made and um, at the governmental level, and that also flows down to industry, right? So industry in the U.S. and elsewhere is following along to those commitments. And so um, there'd be some, there'd be some challenges there. Yes. So the, the Biden administration can, can keep pushing for this, but they cannot do this alone. They do need buy-in from Capitol Hill which has so far publicly say, said that they supported the, the mission to return to the moon, but has been hesitant to pay for it. In the fiscal 2021 funding bills, lawmakers would provide just $1 billion for the landing system to return humans to the moon, which is more than $2 billion below what the administration asked for. So what can, what can the Biden administration do with this resistance in Congress? And do you think the, the uh, sentiment on the Hill will change? Yeah, and that's a that's a great question when you talk about the practicability of the timelines, right? Is that there are programmatic aspects, there are technical aspects, but there are, 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 poli are political and, and funding aspects to that. So, um, I think that's at the heart of our our core. Of, sorry, at the heart of the core of our recommendation to be realistic about the timelines is communicating, you know, um, when we can expect to see results, the funding necessary to achieve those results, and and have that ongoing conversation um, with Congress. And I think. I think um, the current administrator has a done, done a decent job of, of, of building those relationships and we can continue to work, uh, work from that. Um, traditionally, we do see um, space exploration as sort of a, a nonpartisan issue um, in Congress where there are divides, but it's not traditionally along um, you know, Republican Democratic divide it more has to do with uh, traditional um, perhaps state equities or, um, or, or, or other factors. And so I think there, there is a tradition that we can work on um, to build a bipartisan conversation on that, but it continues to be about, in my viewpoint, being realistic about timelines and execution standpoints. And then as well, highlighting the international aspect uh, of this and being a good stable partner, I think is an argument that could be potentially instructive and useful on, on the Hill as well. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues have, have anything to add to that, but that's how I would, um, that's how I would see that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily add to what you have for the Hill, but just again, to emphasize, you know, one of the things that we find such a positive about the Artemis Accords is that there's a recognition that there are responsibilities for using space and that it needs to be approached in a cooperative, collaborative approach. I mean, that, that's a viewpoint I think this Kira really signs on to and that it's something we would like to see encouraged. And so that's what we really feel it's to the U.S.'s benefit to continue this attitude and this method of um, 
evolving how we use space by bringing in international partners and identifying behavior that you want to see happen and making sure that it does. Um, and that's part of a, a re approach that I would, I would say bleeds in, but say colors, um, other ways in which the U.S. uses space. And it definitely affects how other countries view the United States and our space capabilities and space plans. And those have consequences just in general for the international system. So there really are long-term payoffs to um, contributing to these accords and making sure that they happen. So we're cautiously optimistic about that. Uh, just one small point to build on that. There, there's been some criticism that the accords were sort of the US government forcing its position on other governments, which is simply not true. We, we've talked to people around the governments that have participated in the negotiations and, and they, they were collaborative discussions the US had with the existing partners that have all signed on. Uh, there were changes made to the text as a result of, you know, things brought up by the international partners. And, and you know, so part one of the accords, which are these core set of principles, really do represent sort of this group, uh, uh, those the group of countries that were involved so far on what they think the principles should be for future space activities. And, and I think that's a positive sign. And we hope that you know, other countries are going to look at that and engage with the U.S. in discussions and, and hopefully at least sign on to those general principles, um, if not part two, which is sort of the, the actual participation in the arts program themselves. So we, we've talked about a lot of the, the U.S.'s traditional partners in space, Japan and Canada. Are there nations that you think it's, you know, so, sort of low-hanging fruit where there's it's ripe for cooperation. There's either a diplomatic gain or some sort of technological gain. Or are there any new partners in space who you think could be somewhat easily brought into the Artemis program? Well, so, uh, well go ahead. Ian. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I'm aware that you know, there are ongoing conversations um, with, with other partners. I think there are, are, are regions, um, particularly in Latin America, that there may be um, nations. Brazil may be a, may be a, a potential um, part, potential partner for for conversation on the accords and and, and the program itself. Um, there's a some history of, of participation with Brazil in the uh, the International Space Pro, uh, Station program in its early days, and then they kind of uh, pulled back. Um, and we've seen the U.S. engage with Brazil around um, potential use of the of the spaceport um, in in, in Al, Alcantara. Uh, Alcantara. Um, so I think Brazil may be one potential opportunity um, in the in the Latin American region. Um, and I think uh, other European nations as well are, are probably looking at it um, within the context of, of their own decisions and as well as within ESA. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to say, you know, we already see one non-traditional partner, the UAE, which has already signed on. Uh, I think in general, you know, our discussions over the last several years, even before Artemis was announced, there was a lot of interest in the moon. There's a lot of countries that, you know, see the next step in their space program as going to the moon because they didn't go there before, right? And that's and it's you know only a few days away as opposed to Mars is very much a stretch goal when it comes to logistics and infrastructure and all kinds of things. So there already was a lot of international interest for many countries in participating somehow and going to the moon. And so I think the artist program and the cords are, are tapping into that. So yes, we, we expect a lot. And I think it's, it's not just about the low hanging fruit. I think it's about trying to get as broad an international program as possible should be the goal, not just, you know, a small group of, of, of friends and allies. More broadly beyond just the Artemis Accords, though they may be the, the easiest vehicle for, for this, do you expect international engagement on space to change under a Biden administration? I've, I've talked with people who see Biden as sort of this, this deal maker who is going to pursue more collaboration than the Trump administration. Is that, Brian, do you want to start with that? Or are you expecting that? I would say I hope so. I mean, you know, we, we talk in our report about, you know, while the substance of some of the Trump administration's space policies is good, a lot of times that substance was marred by divisive rhetoric. And, and that is what we really hope the Biden administration changes is, for example, the rhetoric with how we approach our traditional allies, NATO and Europe and, 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 and you know, not getting bogged down in things like trade wars that are kind of undermining some of that goodwill. So we definitely hope that there is more of a, a welcoming approach, uh, less divisive rhetoric. You know, there's still going to be, you know, 
there's still going to be uh, debates. There's still going to be questions about, you know, trade issues. There's going to be issues about how countries, you know, can fairly cooperate and, and exchange goods and everything. But we think that could be done less divisively than what we saw from the Trump administration. Yeah, and I think I would add one more element to this, Brian. I mean, I think we all and across the community expect the, the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration to, to re-engage in a lot of um, climate-related uh, initiatives. We've already, of course, seen the, the signal that they plan to rejoin the Paris Agreement. Um, that has been a, a particularly challenging subject for, for the U.S. Uh, under the outgoing administration. You know, work has continued, but it's been difficult to, to talk about it uh, in a broad sense. It's been difficult to engage in a lot of... Um, global initiatives around that topic. And there's a clear space aspect of that. So we would expect to see uh, more engagement from, from the US uh, around that set of uh, activities and issues. Yeah, and then just to add on to that, I mean, the US has some continued interest in, that in, in working internationally on space. Um, we were part under the Trump administration and previous to that, we were very active in the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space where they um, were able to agree to um, 21 long-term sustainability guidelines, uh, which talks about best ways in which to ensure that space is usable to and accessible um, for all over the long term. Um, Securable is very biased because our executive director, Peter Martinez, was the working group chair for that. But we feel it's, it's a really positive um, model, you know, and COPUS is a consensus-driven organization, has 90 plus countries, United States, Russia, China, Iran, all able to come to agreement on this. And so that the US agreed to it because it's to our benefit to have these international approaches. And so that won't be changing under the Biden administration. We're really hoping that actually they will take this um, mantle and kind of run with it a little bit, but it won't, they won't be starting from scratch. They'll be building upon previous efforts there. So you mentioned China and the, the ability to, to work with them through things like the UN. Do you, Victoria, do, do you expect a Biden administration to be more open to, to any sort of engagement in space with China? You know, that's really tough. Um, the United States has a, shall we say, challenging relationship with China, whether it's on the ground or in space. Um, and we oftentimes don't really know how to handle uh, this competitor. Um, the United States is precluded from doing bilateral efforts with China in space, um, NASA and the White House, unless they report to the FBI, um, it's called the Wolf Amendment. Um, and so really it's a challenge. And the United States actually has a history of being concerned about China's um, space plans and I would say overreacting to them and then creating the exact situation that they didn't want to have happen. You know, um, For example, shutting China out of some of the NASA work has precluded um, having China as a partner or engagement um, which allows China to go off and do their own soft power outreach and use space as that, uh, that branch to create connections, which may not be to the United States benefit. So one of the things we recommend in our briefing book is that the United States look at possibly modifying the Wolf Amendment to allow for some early engagement with China, you know, maybe on basic research, science research and development, maybe sharing data on space debris, space weather, cooperation, that sort of thing, just really kind of building the groundwork for future engagement, recognizing, of course, that China is a competitor and there are concerns and they're not gonna go away immediately, but we still need to start working on this. Um, and you know, one of the things we also call for, and I'll let my colleague Ian talk a little bit more about that, is a need for learning more about China's plans for their space capabilities and their programs. Yeah, thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Jacqueline. I mean, so the, the question of do we expect the overall tenor and posture of the relationship to change, I think, um, in general, we would not expect a, a very significant overall U.S. policy change towards China or even um, the other way around, a very significant Chinese policy change towards the U.S. But we do see, I think, opportunity for more nuance in the conversation and, and limited engagement, and specifically engagement, not necessarily cooperation, but to develop that nuance. Um, and one of the areas where I personally do see that opportunity is around uh, commercial space activities. Um, so we clearly see an, a, a wave of commercial space activity in the U.S. And there is a wave of, bless you, private sector and um, quote unquote commercial activities in China as well. Right. By certain measures, China would be the second largest uh, venue for commercial space uh, globally. So 
we see a competitive relationship, but I don't know that there's necessarily the nuance in how that competitive relationship with the private sector in China will develop. What is the structure of the Chinese space ecosystem? How does quote unquote private aerospace companies in China relate to the state owned enterprises and back to the central government? What is the role of provincial governments and other, uh, other uh, authorities within China in the commercial space ecosystem? So we see opportunity to have a dialogue and discussion around the growth of the commercial space sector and learn a little bit more about what that structure looks like. And there may even be some shared interests between US and Chinese private sector space interests, including both countries have large activity going on in the development of very large satellite constellations. And there are some shared challenges there where we may be able to have a, a basic conversation around responsible use and best practice there that may be um, potentially beneficial to both sectors uh, or to both countries. So I think there is limited opportunity for engagement there and definitely a need for more understanding and, and research into that, that, that ecosystem and structure. So while well, the Wolf Amendment doesn't apply to, to the private sector, are, are there still a, a lot of barriers to commercial partnerships between the two countries? Yeah, so commercial partnerships is a, a a tough one when you're talking about uh, U.S. and China, right? I mean, there are there are policy barriers on both sides. There are trust issues on both sides. Um, I mean, you cannot talk about U.S. Chinese relationships in any area in the in any domain of industry activity without having a, a discussion around concerns around intellectual property protections and, and potential theft of intellectual property issues, right? Um, so. I think commercial partnerships, at least in these, any sort of large scale commercial partnerships between the US and China is probably a bridge um, that, that's a long, long way towards being completed. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can have that we cannot have exchange uh, around again some of the common issues that, that I mentioned. Um, you know, a little plug for some work that, that Secure World is doing along with with a partner, Kalos Foundation, where in the final stages of, of finalizing a report on uh, US perceptions of Chinese commercial space. Um, and part of what we found there is that um, if you read Chinese trade press, there's a lot of discussion of China needs a better regulatory structure for commercial space activities and the US is seen as a leader in that regulatory structure. So there may be a, a dialogue that can be held there and um, kind of share some of the, the norms of behavior and best practice that, that we in the US would like to see promulgated globally. Um, so, uh, you know, an optimistic yet limited uh, assessment there. And so I, I do want to go back to sort of what will become of the Wolf Amendment in 2021. And Victoria, sort of, I, I know you recommend that Congress act on this, but what do you think the chances are that this is something that lawmakers will really have the appetite to deal with next year? Well, while I would like to see some modifications done to the Wolf Amendment, and I am hopeful that the next administration will undertake that, um, realistically speaking, it, you know, there's a lot of political capital that need to be expended to modify the Wolf Amendment, much less get rid of it, um, which no one is recommending. Um, and I don't, and it, it's just as easy to say, you know, we've got to be tough on China. We've got to keep an eye on what they're doing on the moon, that sort of thing. That sort of thing plays very well amongst various um, circles in the national security establishment. Um, and so I think it would take someone who is extremely motivated to change the fundamental nature of the US relationship with China um, in regards to engaging with them on this. Um, so we'll see, but um, uh, it's, it's really hard to say at this point. Uh, we're, you know, maybe we'll give the Biden administration like a month in office and then we'll ask them again. So are there any things that NASA, you mentioned that it's a, a burdensome process to go to the FBI, but are there things that NASA can do to, to sort of extend the olive branch to China, even with the Wolf Amendment still in place? Or does that really preclude everything? Well, I will say, um, and my colleagues can jump in here, uh, I can talk all day about this, but um, you know, the United States does interact with China um, on space issues, um, whether it's in multilateral fora, such as the Conference of Disarmament of the United Nations or the Co Community of Peace and Issues Outer Space, uh, there's two plus two space security dialogues. So it's not like there's nothing there. So there is a possibility for space discussions being held. Um, and now the question is, what can NASA do? I mean, again, I think maybe they can be part of, you know, discussions at the multilateral level um, and kind of go from there. I don't know, Brian and Ian, if you want to um, add on to that. Well, I'll just say that, you know, NASA, the administration could go to Congress and make the case 
on why they think they should engage China on a specific space project or typically like science, helium physics, something like that. So far, administrations have been unwilling to do that, but but I think that is always an option. That's that's going to require effort. It's going to require a lot of, you know, don't no one likes to kind of do the you know mother may I to, to, to Congress, but that is always a possibility. Okay, um, so I want to turn to space debris, uh, something you mentioned as a possible area of cooperation with China, since both nations do have satellites in orbit. Um, this is an area where the Trump administration has actually tried to take action, um, but any sort of changes have been bogged down by Congress. So Brian, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about what the incoming Biden administration can do to try to take action on orbital debris if gridlock continues on the Hill. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me expand that a bit. I'm gonna talk about sort of a lot of things wrapped together. You've got how to deal with orbital debris, You've got space situation awareness, which is keeping track of what's in space, and then space traffic management, which is sort of all of that plus oversight of future commercial activities. All that is sort of tied together. Uh, you know, the Obama administration started several efforts on all three of those things. Um, some of them sort of got publicized, some of them did not. The Trump administration continued quite a lot of that. I think the most, the most public thing we saw was Space Policy Directive 3 issued in June 2018, by the Trump administration on space traffic management that you know essentially tried to put the Office of Space Commerce and the Department of Commerce forward as sort of the central coordinator for a lot of these things. Um, quite a lot of that substance SPD3 is good and, and it reflects things that were already sort of underway in the Obama administration. The challenge as you, as you pointed out is that Congress has not stepped up to uh, give Department of Commerce those new authorities nor the additional budget. So that's the real issue there. And from us, you know, our message is sort of stop arguing about where to put it, transportation, commerce, and just do it, right? It, we are well past the time we should have made these decisions. Uh, there's, you know, space, Starlink has put up over a thousand satellites already in the first of what are probably going to be several large constellations. There's a growing amount of CubeSat activity, lots of growing concerns about increased congestion in space, the possibility for collisions, the added burden this puts on operators to kind of keep track of all this and avoid things. We need a federal agency that is involved in all this and is leading on this. The time to do that is, is now. And so this is partly the administration, the administration needs to sort of not, not deviate and go back to a whole reset and another several years arguing over who to do it. You know, work on implementation work with Congress on getting this passed and getting these things, these things done, and then put the U.S. back in the driver's seat in terms of being an international leader on advancing debris mitigation guidelines, on improving SSA data sharing, and on laying the groundwork for a future space traffic management regime. You, you mentioned SpaceX Starlink, the, the super large constellations that are going up. Given, given the rise of this, is this something that Biden will have to deal with over the next four years? Is this something that because of these mega constellations really just can't be pushed out any farther? Oh, absolutely. And I said, it, it should have been dealt with five, 10 years ago, right? That's when we should have actually put this stuff in place. But we spent all this time arguing and kind of debating and going back and forth. So they're already launching, they're already up there. Uh, and, and so yes, the, the oversight you know, governments, regulatory uh, methods for how we're going to deal with these need to be put in place. And, and you know, something the Biden administration absolutely has to do, but in working with Congress, right? They, a lot of the stuff, they can't just do it by themselves on the executive side. Right. And just to, you know, foot stomp what Brian said, I mean, right now there's roughly 3,300, 3,300 active satellites. If you're looking at all the satellites, that have been proposed to the FCC for being launched in the next 10 years, that could be 107,000 satellites. Now, obviously, they're not going to be launched. Some of these are very theoretical, but a good chunk of them are going to be launched. And so you're right, Jacqueline. I mean, this is something, it's not a theoretical construct. These things are happening now. They're being launched now. They're creating issues now. We don't have the luxury of time anymore. They need to start working on policies to work on coordination of this before some sort of crisis forces the hand. 
And just to, to, to add one more level, I, mean, I think we have to recognize that this is not a single regulatory solution, right? It's, it's take the steps now that we know that we need to take, continue to research and refine our understanding, better understand the business imperative, better understand the operational realities. And we're going to have to update and refine regulation. And that's a, that's a process that I think we're all going to have to become comfortable with. And it's a process that is beneficial and that it actually allows um, industry practice and industry standards to be incorporated in a, in, in a regulatory process. So uh, just, I think we need to be, you know, upfront that this is not a, a, a single, you know, here's the regulation, we're done, right? This is going to continue to, to, be, to evolve. So a, a lot of the things we've talked about so far today have been things that you say, you know, the Biden administration will have to go and make the case to Congress. In the Trump administration, Trump has been very pro-space, Pence has had this leadership role on the National Space Council. Who do you sort of see being that person that goes and, and makes the case for these things in a Biden administration, given that Biden so far hasn't been kind of out front talking a lot about these issues. Does this fall to the NASA administrator? Who, who is the person who can kind of take this over? Oh, it's, it's a great question. I think it's one that's really important. So, you know, we have seen very publicly the Trump administration brought back the National Space Council, which I think has served an important role in highlighting some of the public, or bringing some more public attention to a lot of these issues, but also, you know, bringing more interagency attention to these issues. There's something to be said for having, you know, the heads of all these federal agencies and departments having to get on stage, you know, every few months to talk about their progress on implementing policy and addressing some of these issues. That's sort of a forcing function within the bureaucracy to kind of drive implementation. I think, it, I think it's important. Um, but, but this is, you know, where do we go from here is, is, is a real, is, a, is an important question. I think, you know, the Biden administration has shown that, you know, its priorities are on recovering from COVID, on improving the economy, bringing back the millions of jobs that have been lost, uh, dealing with climate change, diversity, inclusion. I think space can play a role in all of those, but, you know, space is not front and for, for, first and foremost on their issue. I think it's partly it's up to the space community to try and make the case as to why space is important, how space can help address a lot of those priorities for the Biden-Harris administration, uh, and, and then why it's important to continue some of these things. That's sort of one of the big reasons that we're, we're putting out the, this, this issue briefing. Um, you know, we hope the Space Council continues. We think it has served a positive function, whether it's led by the vice president or maybe even the president going forward, because it is POTUS that leads the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, the National, uh, sorry, the, the Homeland Security uh, Council, all these other high level interagency councils led by, by the, the president. So I think that's something we, we should consider a, as an option. Anyways, we, we hope it continues. Um, that said, there are a couple of changes we, we would like to see made. Um, one is on the user's advisory group. I think it's great that there is a group of outside of government entities advising on these issues. We think some work could be done to make that a little more representative of the actual users of space uh, and not just companies that are in some cases trying to get you know, government contracts. So making it more focused on users would be a good step. Um, and then there's also this issue of, you know, some of these space council meetings tend to be a little bit more of a political performance than a substantive discussion of the issues. Some of that is politics, but again, we think there could be efforts made to help, you know, again, focus it more on a public discussion of some of the substantive issues that need to be dealt with. And so kind of following up on, on the fact that you think the, that you are recommending that Biden keep the National Space Council, what will be the practical impact if that goes away? Is it really just sort of the, the visual of having everyone together or is there, is there policy that will, will fall by the wayside if that goes away? Well, it's a great question. You know, we made very important and meaningful space policy decisions without the Space Council during the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the, the Obama administration. Uh, so it is not the Space Council is necessary to make good policy. Um, a lot of that depends upon then what happens with the staffing of the National Security Council or the Office of Science Technology Policy, which are the two places where space policy has traditionally been led when there was not a National Space Council. So that still could happen. I think the damage will be the public perception of these activities. 
you know, most people don't, don't know what OSTP is, let alone that, you know, they, they co-chaired a lot of the space policy decisions in the, the, the Clinton administration and the Obama administration. So I, I think it'll be harder to sort of get that public awareness and, and sort of public engagement on these issues if the Space Council goes away and it sort of reverts back to sort of more down in the bureaucracy, less, less visible uh, entities that are running the process, but it would still continue. And, and, you know, one of the big questions is whether or not we've had any better space policy decisions or not uh, with the Space Council. That's a, that's a question for academics in the future. Um, and there's also this issue of, of implementation, right? If there's less public attention, are, is maybe a, a implementation going to fall off a little bit? So you sort of touched on this, but I, I would like all three of you to weigh in on sort of how to maintain this high level of space amid very high unemployment and uh, a slow economy and you know more than 250,000 people killed by this virus. We have talked today about so many things that require urgent attention, but there's just so much else going on in the world. So how do you focus on space amid everything. Victoria, would you like to start and then we'll go go to all three of you? Uh, sure. I mean, yes, there are a lot of priorities that are really pressing. You know, this is a rough time for everyone. I, I think that everyone acknowledges that. It's just that space is a key enabler for national security, is a key enabler for the economy, is a key enabler for how so our society functions. So it is almost like the glue that holds a lot of this together. Um, and so much like Lou, it's not really visible to the outside, but it is there and it is needed. Um, so that's where we, we make the argument that, you know, obviously there's a bit of triage going on clearly, uh, but this is something that shouldn't be overlooked. It is really important and needs to be incorporated to make sure it's accessible to and usable for us over the long term. It's to the US long-term national interest to focus on this. Brian, would you like to address that next? Yeah, I think part of this is recognizing that the US government can do a lot of things at once, right? So, you know, yes, we, we should be focused on those issues you address. Those are really pressing national challenges, but there's lots of other people that can also be focusing on space and also how space can help address those. You know, we often hear a lot about the role of spaces in the economy and driving jobs. In some cases, that has been a little more uh, flash then bang, right? It's not, not quite as much substance. I think a lot more could be work on how to truly make space industry an economic driver and, and job creator, that, like, especially down at, the, at the, the state level, the regional level. I think there's a lot of work that could be done there. Um, and then also by putting in place good people, right? You know, a lot of this, you know, to quote the current executive secretary of Space Council, people matter a lot in the process of making space policy. Uh, so I think, you know, a lot will hinge on who the Biden administration puts into key places, Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation, NASA Administrator, uh, you know, National you know, Space Council or National Security Council, Office of Science and Technology Policy. Those are really important jobs. Ian, so, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, so following my, my two colleagues, they, they uh, leave me a tough job to, to add any additional color to that. But I, you know, from where I sit, um, the, the space industry has actually weathered the, the pandemic fairly well thus far, right? We have, we, we've seen, you know, act business activity has continued, programmatic activity has continued, investment activity has continued. So I think it, it, part of the answer to this is the space industry just needs to continue to communicate. Hey, we've done, we're, we're, we're pushing forward and we're having, you know, we're, we're continuing with success and, and let's, let's keep building upon that and not, um, you know, not not uh, not not find disruption um, where where it where it doesn't necessarily exist. So I think that that's a message that that, that our community needs to uh, take upon itself to do is just to con communicate uh, the continued momentum that we have. Um, and I also think there's an opportunity here, um, and this again maybe a little bit with uh, optimistic glasses on, but we have examples of success where space shows us that in the U.S. system we can get things done in a bipartisan or even nonpartisan fashion. So. The, the fanfare around uh, the, the SpaceX crew flights this year, right? That is a program that has a history of across three administrations almost, right? And, and that is an example of how space can be used to drive, drive activity, drive success that does not involve necessarily the vitriol of some of the partisan fights that we see, right? And I think that, you know, 
as the Biden administration uh, tries to work with Congress to address some of these massive challenges that, that it's facing, um, finding an area where there can be bipartisan or nonpartisan uh, cooperation is going to be important. So I think space has a, has a role to play there. So I am getting ready to turn to audience questions soon. So get those in if you haven't. It looks like we already have a bunch of good ones there. But before we do this, it, it is obvious in reading the report that you guys put so much time and effort into it. So I just want to give each of you the opportunity to share sort of any any highlights or anything from the report that I didn't ask you about that you really want to put out there. If you have you know a, a favorite nugget or, or some really important theme that we haven't gotten to highlight yet here today. Um, we can start with Brian. Uh, you know, I, I think I would just reemphasize sort of one of our core points, which is don't reset the clock on a lot of these. You know, keep the the substance that was meaningful that has been developed across a couple different administrations. Focus on sort of continuing the progress. Focus on implementation. And and what needs to be fixed is sort of the divisive rhetoric and and, and some of the the the. the political aspects of some of these things. I would just add really quickly in our national security chapter, we talk about the need to really redefine what we mean for space deterrence. What are we actually trying to accomplish? Um, there is a vocal minority that seems to think it's threat of reprisal via offensive counter space weapons. And that definitely needs to be debunked. We need to really think the, okay, what are we trying to deter? Who are we trying to deter? And how are we planning on doing that? And how do we want to get to resiliency? Um, to, to really think, rethink how we approach those sort of things because um, what we've been doing has not, well, we've been talking about it for over a decade now, but not really come to any sort of decision-making process the way that we can implement the way Brian recommended. And, you know, for me, um, I just, uh, first off, I want to, you know, it's, it's Brian, Victoria, and I and the scholars want to thank the, the rest of the colleagues um, at Secure World that also contributed to this brief. Um, Chris Johnson, Crystal Hazelton, um, Peter Martinez, Daniel Parson, and, and, and our operations um, team as well. So just again, thank, thanks to the colleagues. It's not just the three of us, of course, that, that wrote this. Um, I think topically, um, one thing that is a thread throughout the brief, and we do a specific chapter on it, but it's throughout, is just the role that diplomacy and international engagement and um, you know, the role of other agencies outside of you know, commerce and NASA can play in supporting all of these initiatives and, and doing it at a global level, right? Space is, as space becomes more important from a security standpoint, from an economic standpoint, it becomes more important from a diplomatic standpoint, and there's an important um, thread there to, to pay attention to as well. So I think that is uh, something I'd wanna emphasize here. So we have one audience question. We've talked a lot about the language the Trump administration uses around space. And just the fact that the Pentagon has gotten way more open, calling space a war fighting domain and talking about threats in space. This question says, since the Trump administration introduced the war fighting, war fighting domain term, should the Biden administration simply retire it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So first I'll say, you know, the Trump administration was, was the first US administration to talk about that publicly and refer to space public as a war fighting domain. But internally, the US government had, had thought about space as a warfight in domain long before the Trump administration came, came along. And that, that terminology of a warfighting domain has a specific meaning within the US military. So I, I don't think we can, we can change and say that space is not a warfighting domain. From the, the military's perspective, it is. I, I think that uh, first we need to stop using that every 30 seconds as the only thing will refer to space as, particularly from a military standpoint. And second, do a better job explaining what that means. Again, it has to do more about the mindset you have when dealing with challenges, when dealing with anomalies, and when building systems, rather than looking to go out and actually, you know, break things and blow things up. So I would say, you know, do better job educating what we mean by that, and just stop using it as the only way we talk about space, which seems to be what's happening for the last you know, couple of years. Right, and it, that builds a larger conversation. You know, space has a national security element to it, and there's no getting around that. It's for the United States, but it's not just the United States, there are other countries as well. I mean, just within the past year or so, we saw both France and Japan stand up their version of the Space Force, or a version of the Space Force. Um, you know, Kingdom has expressed interest in this. Um, so. The, you know, NATO has declared it an operational domain. 
So I think the momentum is, is has already been established that space is being used as a national security enabler. But as Brian said, I think it's important to really rejigger how the United States refers to it, and it, it's helpful when you don't have a leader, you know, proclaiming, um, you know, make America great, and you know, it kind of leading the rhetoric in terms of that um, emphasis, the United States is going to be the dominant actor to the detriment of anyone else. Um, I think it's part of a, overall an approach that is perhaps um, better defined as being more cooperative. And I think we'll actually do more to further U.S. national security um, goals and hopes and dreams, as opposed to just you know, continuing with the same tired rhetoric. We have another question here. We have talked a lot today about future partnerships with, with China and what that's going to look like, but um, what is the future of cooperation in space with Russia and India? Well, I can take first crack at that and my colleagues can jump in. Um, I always feel like I start off by saying it's complicated, but it is complicated. I mean, the US and Russia obviously have decades of um, competition in terms of space, but also decades of cooperation. You see the International Space Station has been you know, active for over two decades now. Um, and so there is kind of a turning point in terms of how we are gonna be approaching space um, together. Um, as well, uh, so I think we'll be figuring out where we wanna move ahead with you know, space uh, superpowers as well, because there's counter space capabilities together. Um, India is a particular interest of mine. Um, India has really evolved how they approach space. It used to be used for um, you know, social economic development. And over the past decade or so, it's evolved to have a more military component. And that's, I think, in line with how a lot of countries are approaching space. So it's not atypical. But of course, India was the fourth country to launch anti satellite tests in 2019 and um, has also stood up its version, or starting to think about starting up its own version of the space agency, a defense space agency, um, without actually publishing a national space policy or really giving any indication as to what their priorities or goals are for their mission, for their space capabilities. So I think that does make it complicated to figure out how can we cooperate together, two major space powers, when we don't know where one of them is actually going. So that would be my recommendation that India start to think about that. And also India has started to invest in its own space situation awareness capabilities, which may be a possibility for cooperation as a partner later on. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, just quickly, I don't know that, I mean, Russia is, sorry, Russia is complicated. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, actually the US relationship in multilateral fora with Russia, with China is better than Russia at the moment. The, it's been the, the Russians that have sort of been one of the main uh, uh, you know, antagonists for some of the recent diplomatic discussions uh, on space, uh, at least from a US perspective uh, and, and not China. So that's really, really difficult. My sense is that when the ISS partnership ends, we're probably gonna be in a much different place with Russia. It's gonna be much more difficult to sort of come up with a bilateral cooperation. That doesn't mean we can't try. We can't. We shouldn't try. Uh, again, as I said, the, part of the value of the Artemis Accords is getting, you know, sort of a, a growing group of countries, perhaps at some point in the future, reaching a consensus on certain interpretations of international legal principles. So the more a country we can bring into that, I think the better it will be. Particularly some of the major spacefaring countries: India, you mentioned Brazil earlier hopefully even China, Russia. And I was going to, I was going to mention, you know, Jacqueline earlier, you asked us, you know, what non-traditional partners might the U.S. engage around Artemis? I would say India would be a, a very prime example um, of that, of that type of, of country, right? Where it's very significant space capabilities, um, very significant engagement at the multilateral level in, in certain ways and, and, and uh, kind of non-aligned in terms of, of space exploration activities. So, I was going to raise that example. The other place I think that there is opportunity for for engagement cooperation with India, in particular, to a lesser extent, uh, China, but to a host of other countries, is just development of regulatory frameworks and and practices for commercial space. So in the last year, we've seen India um, kind of liberalize in a way its uh, regulatory scheme to enable a, a broader private sector role in, in space activities. I think there's a opportunity for the U.S. to lead a dialogue with, with nations around you know, how uh, we need to have some commonality in the regulation uh, of space activities. So 
think that might be an opportunity there as well. Maybe not as exciting as, as some of the other ones, but uh, but important in other ways. So. We have a space sustainability question. We've talked about Biden's focus on climate change. Are you expecting a Biden administration to see space sustainability as an extension of Earth sustainability initiatives and make that a priority as a result? So I'll start. I, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be like a formal marrying, let's say, including space in sort of climate change discussions, but. I, I do hope that some of the the, fr the conceptual frameworks for how we think about dealing with a changing environment and, and sustainable development do flow over to the space world. Uh, there's been a lot of discussions, you know, in the terrestrial world about these problems and these issues, and many of them have parallels to to space. Uh, so I, I think there's sort of a almost be borrowing some of the intellectual framework and some of the intellectual uh, discussions. And, and the thoughts on mechanisms and, and how to do some of these things from the terrestrial environmental discussion to space, I think that that would be a big benefit uh, for the space world. And then also, of course, reinforcing the message that part of the reason we should care about space sustainability is that satellites and, and space data is one of the big tools we have for knowing what's happening in the world and understanding the changing environment and managing things like changing climate, natural disasters, and, and sustainable development. I would like to add, I mean, I think it'd be, I agree with Brian, I think it'd be very helpful to pick up some of the intellectual framework and the heavy lifting that's already been done for climate discussions and see how it's appropriate to, for space environmental management. It is something we talk about the need for that. But also, let me, let's be honest, climate change has become a very, partisan issue. It's become very political. And right now, in terms of you know, space debris, that's not really a political issue. Um, so I would encourage us to try and keep it that way, um, just because it, it literally is global. Um, and it affects everyone, a Republican, Democrat, emerging space country, established space power, that sort of thing. Um, and so it really behooves us to have a cooperative approach um, as a political one as is possible in the world we live in. Uh, another question, sort of sustainability focused about mining the moon and mining asteroids. Uh, if you're expecting the incoming Biden administration to pull back a little on the, the emphasis on collecting resources in space that the, the Trump administration has had. So uh, I'll, I'll start um, with this and then Brian, Victoria, you want to jump in. Um, so the commercial use of resources or the legality of that, is, that's actually longstanding US policy that that, that is, is, is permitted. Um, what we would like to see is a little more realism around uh, the economics argument, uh, an economic discussion of that and, and the timeline and some uh, movement away from some of the, uh, again, the divisive language around thing declaring like that space is not a uh, global commons. Um, so we expect that the US will continue to have an interest in space resources utilization expect to have a, an interest in promoting commercial space resources utilization, indeed to have sustained um, space exploration activities involving uh, humans, you have to have, have some level of space resources utilization. So expect that to continue, expect the US to engage that, but we do hope to see um, both more, uh, less divisive diplomatic language and, and a better economic understanding of the, of the timing and nature of those activities. I mean, if I, and if I may be blunt, I mean, just building off Ian's point about less divisive language. I mean, you hear a lot of discussion in national security circles about the moon being the ultimate high ground and how suddenly, you know, we need to be worried about China's approach to sizzling orbits and they'll park something up there. And, you know, first of all, the moon is a satellite earth, so it circles around. So, I mean, the utility of it for some stuff is not really merited by some of the arguments, um, but it really does benefit to try to think about, okay, how do we want to approach this sort of thinking? And, um, as Izzy and said, the rhetoric has not been helpful and in fact, oftentimes becomes self-reinforcing. You know, you see the United States saying things about China's presumed plans for the moon and then that feeds into um, a, a race of rhetoric that has not been helpful for international cooperation on these issues. Yeah. Uh, to, just to add to that, I think it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, to Ian's point, exactly right, that US policy hasn't changed, but the public perception of that policy has in part because maybe a lot of people didn't know that was US policy before Trump sort of talking about it, but also because they sort of, their their perception of what that policy means is is colored 
by Trump's other attitudes and actions and sort of opinions. So I that, that that's sort of what we're trying to get to here is trying to at least if what what are you possible separate the substance from the the, the the politics and the perception. I think one area that we do need to do is to, you know, the U.S. needs to ensure that there are continued multilateral discussions on these issues with a range of viewpoints in places like UN Copius, uh, because, you know, th there's still a lot of unsettled legal, legal questions for them on how to, how to practically do a lot of these things, um, even if we get a degree that, yes, it is possible to extract some resources without having deed of ownership to the land. What does that mean? What are the limits? How do we oversight of that? What are the Article 6 implications? There's still a lot of work to be done on that. Uh, so this next question is, is there a way to create a commercial space equivalent of the Artemis Accords? And if so, would that be a way to engage with China? Ian, do you want to start on that one? I'm going to steal a line from Victoria. That is a challenging question um, <laughs> as, as I think about it. I mean, so a commercial space equivalent of the Ar Ar Artemis Accord. So that would be maybe a thing to think with that through that. That would be maybe a set of, of best practices or standards through which commercial companies agree that they will that, that they will operate on um, in the lunar context or, or in any other context. Um, I, I think that's theoretically possible. I mean, it doesn't... Uh, suffers from many of the same um, barriers that we talked about in terms of, of commercial partnerships um, between the US and China, right? The same trust issues, the same concerns around uh, around IP, those sorts of things. But um, you know, the, the international standards process is something that exists and does work well. Um, we, you know, Brian and I have worked with 41 companies around standards for, um, for best uh, standards for on-orbit servicing. Um, and that has gone to the International Standards Organization. And I believe, Brian, that there's been some engagement um, with, with the Chinese representatives to, to that delegation um, once it's moved beyond, beyond us. So that, that, that is theoretically possible. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty heavy lift, um, though, especially in the lunar context. Yeah, so to add on, it's interesting. We've, we've already seen a couple uh, uh, incidents of the commercial industry getting together and putting out their own sort of, you know, best practice or guidelines. So recent one was the Space Safety Coalition, which is a group of roughly 40 organizations, mostly satellite operators, Kerwold's also part of this, who have all sort of signed on to a set of operating best practices, uh, mostly around orbital, you know, how to operate a satellite, orbital mitigation, end of life practices uh, for Earth orbit that go above and beyond what is technically required by governments under licensing. So that, that's an example of you know, industry getting together and sort of setting their own guidelines because they think it's in their own best interest. Uh, I, it's certainly possible to see that happen for cislunar activities. I think for right now, the challenge is though that almost all these cislunar activities that I'm aware of are being done by government funding uh, and, or are part of a government program. So we're not, we're not there. We see completely independent commercial activities happening uh, on the moon. Uh, I think we probably have time for one more audience question. Um, will Biden be looking for a signature space item uh, during his presidency the same way that Trump pursued the, the Space Force and the 2024 moon goal? Uh, and if so, what, what do you think it would be for Biden? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll start. I, I honestly don't think so. Again, given the, the priorities have been laid out as we talked about earlier, there are huge pressing national issues with COVID recovery, with the economy, um, with you know dealing with other issues that are gonna draw his attention. I think that is probably where his attention is focused. But I don't think that's really a bad thing for the space world. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the downside to having a top level political leader personally involved in space is then the issues and programs become tied to that political leader uh, and, and that introduces the element of partisanship. And that's sort of what we're talking about right now, right? If, you know, if there's easily could have been a chance where a lot of these same space policy issues happened without Trump being so personally attached to them, I think there would have been less of a concern about whether we can keep them or not. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not convinced that, that always having top political leaders personally involved is a good thing. It, it can help, but also, can bring some other challenges with it. So at the end, I think 
look, I hope the Biden administration as a whole continues these policies uh, and, and furthers them in several cases that we've talked about in terms of the implementation so that, you know, because it's all about the United States as a whole. It's not about one specific politician. Yeah, and I, I'd mostly agree with that. I would say that I, I think the Biden administration is going to look for signature achievements in, in the climate um, change and re-engagement there. And there's a space element to that that, that connects, but it won't, it won't be a space-focused initiative in and of itself, right? Um, so I think that that exists, but I, I would agree that that um, it's not necessarily a, a, a negative for there not to be a, a, a core presidential focus in terms of a, a must-have achievement in, in the sector that is a, such a window to, to continue with existing uh, existing momentum. I'm going to use this opportunity to disagree with my colleagues. Um, I actually think, I mean, every administration likes to have some stamp they can point at and say, this is what we did in space. You know, we had we're going to go to the moon. No, we're going to go to an asteroid. No, we're going to go back to the moon and we're going to go to Mars. I mean, it, it's nice to have an end goal. And so I think that Biden administration will not be any different, that they will have some sort of focused discussion about what they want to achieve in space. Um, but, you know, I do agree that this, this incoming administration is not quite as likely to put its uh, a self-aggrandizing twist to a lot of this sort of thing. And that's what I think honestly tainted a lot of what happened in the current administration and their space capabilities. So I'm hoping that they'll have a more collaborative, cooperative approach to their space, to the US space program. Well, great. We are out of time for today, but thank you to Brian, Ian, and Victoria for the super insightful discussion. And thank you to everyone watching at home. Um, I really hope you enjoyed the conversation. It, I mean, it, it just seems like the Biden administration has a, a long to-do list for space over the next four years. And we will definitely be watching and, and staying on top of how they tackle all these issues. Um, if you missed any bits of today's panel or want to go back and check a recording and a transcript of the event will be posted online soon. So thank you again and have a great afternoon.